In our lesson today, we are going to discuss the mechanism of gaseous exchange in mammals. So our lesson is going to be broken down as such. Number one, what are the structures that are involved in the breathing system, you know, in the respiratory system in mammals? Number two, how does inhalation and exhalation occur in mammals? And lastly, how does gaseous exchange occur across the alveoli? So let us start with the first one. So the breathing system in mammals consists of the following structures. We have the nose and the nasal cavity, of course. We also have the trachea, the bronchi, the bronchioles, and the air sacs. These are found in the lungs. Now we also have the chest cavity that consists of the ribs and intercostal muscles. And lastly, and most important, is the diaphragm. So let us mention how these structures are adapted to their function. Starting with the nose. Now the nose has two openings. These are called the nostrils. It is through these openings that air passes into our body. Now as air moves across the nasal cavity, it is filtered, warmed and moistened. Now let us discuss how these three activities take place and why they are important. So number one, the lining of the nasal cavity has hairs. Yes, I guess this is obvious. Everyone at this point knows that we have hair in the nasal cavity. But did you know that your hairs play a very important role in filtering the incoming air? So they trap any foreign particles such as dust particles in the air, therefore preventing them from entering the trachea. Okay, so we've talked about filtering of the air. So how is the air moistened? Now, the inner lining of the nasal cavity has these specialized cells called goblet cells. Now, what is a specialized cell? This is simply a cell that has a specific function. And in order for it to perform that function, it has a specific structure. Now, in the case of the goblet cells, their function is secretion of mucus. Whenever you see the term goblet cells, know that that is their function. So, they secrete mucus. Now, this mucus helps in trapping dust particles and any microorganisms present in the incoming air. So, it prevents them from entering the lungs. Now, the mucus also has another function and that is it moistens the air as it enters the nostrils. Now, this is important because moist air is more efficient at diffusion than dry air. Now, moving on to the third activity, where the air is warmed. Remember, we talked about the air being filtered, moistened, and warmed. So, when it comes to warming of the air, this happens through the blood capillaries. Blood capillaries are the smallest vessels that we have in our body. So, within the blood capillaries, you're going to have blood. Now, one of the functions of blood is that it distributes heat. So, what happens is that when the air comes into contact with the blood capillaries, it is warm. And this is very important because number one, warm, moist air diffuses faster than cold, dry air. Number two is that the tissues in the respiratory tract, especially the alveoli, are sensitive and delicate and they can be easily damaged by cold, dry air. So moistening and warming the air helps to protect these tissues. Capish? Now, one last thing about the nasal cavity is that it also has olfactory cells. These are cells for detection of smells. So, they detect any smells present in the incoming air, which as you can imagine, is very important for our survival. Okay, now moving on to the trachea. So, the trachea is a tube-like structure that acts as a passage for air into the lungs. Now, one unique characteristic about the trachea is that it's surrounded by these rings of cartilage. So what is cartilage? Cartilage is a strong connective tissue. Now this is not as tough of course as bone, but it's firm and rigid more than skin actually. So we have different parts of our body that are made up of cartilage. We have the ears. Our ears are made up of an elastic cartilage. We also have the tip of our nose, that is where we can move it a bit, the ribs and the trachea of course. Now, you might be asking, what is the function of cartilage? So, as mentioned, trachea acts as a passage for air. So, it needs to be open at all times. So, essentially, what the cartilage does is that it reinforces the trachea, you know, ensuring that it's always open 
for the passage of air. It does not collapse. Now, a few things to note about the trachea. Number one is that the trachea has goblet cells. Ding, ding, goblet cells. What did we say about them? They secrete mucus. So the mucus traps the dust particles and microorganisms. So there are those particles and those pathogens that might not have been trapped by the mucus in the nasal cavity. Kumbe, we have mucus in the trachea waiting for them. So, yeah, that is the purpose of the goblet cells. Now, once they have been trapped in the mucus, we need to come up with a way that will sweep away this mix so that it doesn't end up clogging the trachea. I want you to imagine this. So, we are going to have a mix containing mucus, microorganisms, and dust particles. Now, we need to sweep this away continuously. Otherwise, it's going to end up blocking the trachea. And this is dangerous because that means air cannot pass in effectively. So this is where the cilia come in. Now, the inner lining of the trachea has cilia. Cilia are these microscopic hair-like structures. So the cilia bit in webs to move the mucus and the dust particles to the pharynx for removal. Now, we are done with the description of the trachea. So moving on. So what happens at the end of the trachea? So as the trachea enters the lungs, it divides to form two smaller tubes. These are known as bronchi. A singular one is known as a bronchus. Now the bronchi further divide to form even smaller tubes called bronchioles. Now the bronchioles are the ones that open up into the air sacs that we know of as alveoli. So of course, the alveoli are going to be found in the lungs. Now, before we actually start with the description of the alveoli, let us just describe the lungs themselves. So number one, the lungs are found in the chest cavity. They are surrounded by a membrane that is known as the pleural membrane. So the pleural membrane is very important and it has two functions. Number one, it maintains the shape of the lungs. And number two, it also secretes the pleural fluid. Now the pleural fluid acts as a lubricant. So what happens is that during breathing movements, you're going to have the contraction and relaxation of muscles. You're going to have the movement of the lungs and the chest cavity, all of which can bring about friction. Now in order to reduce friction, remember friction comes in when two surfaces rub against one another. So if this was to happen over time, what will happen is that these surfaces are going to become worn out. So in order to prevent this, you have the pleural fluid. So it reduces friction between the lungs and the chest cavity during breathing. So it ensures that there's easy movement of the lungs. Now the lungs are surrounded by ribs, those bones. So the ribs are long and curved. They form a cage around the lungs. As you can imagine, one of their function is going to be protective. They protect the lungs from mechanical damage, you know, physical damage. And number two is that they also provide a surface area for the attachment of intercostal muscles. So intercostal muscles are muscles that are involved in breathing. So as usual with muscles, they need to have a surface to attach to. So the ribs provide a large surface area for the attachment of the intercostal muscles. Okay, let's go back to the alveoli. So alveoli are the respiratory surfaces in mammals. This is where actual exchange of gases takes place. I'm talking about diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide. Now we are going to discuss this in detail later on, but as of now, I just want to talk about the structure of the alveoli and how it adapts them to their function. Number one, the alveoli are numerous. In case you're wondering how many alveoli do we have, then let me tell you, we have more than 400 million alveoli in our lungs. Incredible, right? Now, these many alveoli provide a large surface area for efficient gaseous exchange. Now, gaseous exchange occurs by diffusion. This is the process whereby particles uh, diffuse from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration. And this is essentially what happens with the respiratory gases, oxygen and carbon dioxide. They diffuse across the alveoli membrane. Now, anything that speeds up the rate of diffusion will, of course, make the gaseous exchange process to be efficient. So in this case, 
by providing a large surface area, you ensure that the fusion occurs rapidly, therefore the whole process becomes effective. Another characteristic of the alveoli is that they are covered by a thin epithelium. Why? To reduce the distance across which the respiratory gases diffuse for efficient gaseous exchange. Back to the fusion we go. If you have a thin membrane, the particles can easily diffuse across it because they only need to pass across a short distance. So in this case, the thin epithelium reduces the distance across which the gases diffuse, ensuring that gaseous exchange is efficient. Our third characteristic, alveoli are highly vascularized. So when you talk about vascularization, we simply mean that they have blood capillaries. But in the case of the alveoli, they take it to another level. They don't just have blood capillaries. They have a dense network of capillaries. You know, so many blood capillaries surrounding them. So blood capillaries are the smallest blood vessels in our body. And of course, because they are blood vessels, their main function is going to be transportation of substances. In this case, transportation of oxygen and carbon four oxide. So you're going to be having oxygen and carbon four oxide diffusing from the alveoli into the blood vessels and vice versa. Now, if you have a lot of blood capillaries, what will happen is that you're going to have faster transportation of the gases. Immediately, the gases diffuse into the blood vessels. They are transported away. So this is going to create a steep concentration gradient. Okay, let's pause there. Coming back to diffusion, one of the main factors that affects diffusion is concentration gradient. So concentration gradient is whereby you're going to have a difference in the number of particles between two regions. By the way, let me just say this. If you have challenges understanding these factors, you know the ones that affect diffusion, I have a video where I'm explaining this and I'm sure by the end of that video, you're going to be so good not only in diffusion but also in explaining the characteristics of respiratory surfaces such as alveoli. So be sure to check it out. Now coming back to this, as stated, concentration gradient occurs when you have a difference in the number of particles between two regions. So if you have these two regions and one region has more particles than the other, then you're talking about having a concentration gradient. Diffusion only happens when you have a concentration gradient, which makes sense, guys. If you have two regions and they have the same number of particles, like why is diffusion even taking place? So there has to be a difference. And the particles are going to diffuse from the region of high concentration to the region of low concentration. Now, the thing is, when you have a large difference between the number of particles in two regions, then the rate of diffusion becomes faster. So in this case, by having this dense network of capillaries surrounding the alveoli, we are ensuring that the respiratory gases are transported very quickly, ensuring that we have this steep concentration gradient. Steep simply means a large, okay? A large concentration gradient between the two, between the alveoli and the blood vessels. So there's always going to be a high difference between the concentration of oxygen and carbon four oxide present within these two regions. And as such, gaseous exchange is going to be very effective. Our last characteristic of the alveoli is that they are covered by a thin layer of moisture. Why? So that the respiratory gases can dissolve and diffuse in solution form. Now guys, I want to say something. See, all these four characteristics that I've just mentioned, actually what I have here are adaptations. So an adaptation is when you combine the structure and the function. So in this case, the alveoli have a certain structure that enables them or that adapts them to perform a specific function, which is gaseous exchange. Now, when I talk about the characteristics, you know, the fact that they have a large surface area, they are thin, they are highly vascularized, and uh, they are moist, all of these characteristics are going to be present in any respiratory surface. For example, gill filaments in fish, check. The skin in amphibians such as frogs, check and check. So if you are asked for the characteristics of any respiratory surface, these are the ones. Now, this is going to be part one of our video. I did not want to make it extremely long. Part two will be where I'll be discussing the actual mechanism of breathing, you know, inhalation and exhalation. See you there.